Hello, and welcome to this session for the Herman Mountain Ski Patrol Junior Patrol Advanced First Aid class. I'm Jonathan Busco, and today we'll be covering bandaging wounds, which actually will cover both dressing wounds and bandaging wounds. So dressings are basically cloth materials typically that are used to cover an open wound and touch the wound. And the process of dressing a wound includes putting on both the dressings and the bandages. When I took my first DMT class, I had trouble keeping those straight. But an easy way to think about it is you put dressing directly on your salad, you put a dressing directly on the wound. And then that leaves the bandage as the other thing, and that other thing is the thing you wrap around the dressing to keep it in place. Because you're applying the dressing directly to a wound, it's an open wound, you know that you have a break in the skin, so your risk of infection goes up. So ideally, you want a sterile dressing, or at least something that's very clean. You want something that's larger than the wound because you're attempting to isolate the wound from the outside world. You like something that's thicker, so it absorbs whatever's leaking out of the wound. And by this point, hopefully, you've got good hemorrhage control. The bleeding is stopped or at least well controlled. But wounds will tend to leak out other fluids, what are called serous fluids. And basically, it's what comes from the injury to the cells and the increased blood flow to help the wound heal. You can leak out some clear fluid. They should be soft because you don't want to make the wound any worse. And something compressible because as you put the bandage on, you're going to want the dressing to conform to the wound somewhat. And you want it to be lint-free because you don't want to fill your wound up with debris and foreign objects. So when we initially put dressings on, we're using them to help control bleeding. And they do that by providing a, a matrix somewhere that blood can form clots. And so when we initially put them on and we stop the bleeding, they're part of the clot. And very early on, if you pull them off, you pull the clot off, you start the bleeding again. They help to decrease the risk of infection and contamination of the wound. So that's useful. It's not 100%, but it's nice to keep stuff out. They'll absorb any of the drainage and they'll protect the wound in two major ways. First, wounds hurt a lot because you're exposing nerve endings. You remove the superficial layers of skin or you open the skin up, you expose nerve endings. Those nerve endings exposed to the air hurt. So if you isolate them from the air, you decrease the pain. They also keep the wound from being physically struck, particularly a large, thick, soft, compressible dressing that absorbs some force will keep you from bumping that raw wound against anything that would hurt. So there's different types of dressings. There are gauze pads and those are typically used for small to mid-sized wounds and they're packaged usually sterilely. You can get them bulk that aren't sterile but are clean. There are adhesive strips often referred to as band-aids that basically have a gauze dressing built into a plasticized glue-based strip to hold it in place. And then there are these large trauma dressings, which are large, they're thick, they're absorbent, and they tend to get emergency care providers into more trouble than anything else. Because, as you should know at this point, when you're controlling bleeding, the bleeding comes out of the wound, but it's not the wound that's bleeding. It is very specific blood vessels within the wound that are bleeding. And the way you control that bleeding is by applying direct pressure to those areas where those blood vessels are bleeding. So if someone has a 7 centimeter wound, so a wound about yay big, and it's only bleeding at one end, applying the dressing and direct pressure to the other end isn't going to stop the bleeding. It needs to be applied directly in the area where the bleeding is occurring. And unfortunately, oftentimes the dressings are just piled onto the wound. Now, if you're using small 4x4 four four gauze dressings and they're quickly soaking through blood, you realize, hey, I'm not controlling the bleeding. But if you slap a big trauma dressing on that can absorb an awful lot of blood, 
you may have no control of the bleeding at all, but because you've covered it and you can't see it, you don't realize that, and the patient continues to have significant bleeding until finally it starts to run out from the trauma dressings. And people bleed to death from these external wounds and from external bleeding, so we need to be really conscientious about making sure we're controlling the bleeding and that the dressing helps us to do that and doesn't get us into trouble. In the out-of-hospital setting, in the wilderness setting, you may find that you need to come up with an improvised dressing. You want them to be clean. They're probably not going to be sterile if you're improvising them, but you don't want it to be grossly contaminated. Again, absorbent, soft, protects the wound, and you want to keep from contaminating the wound with bits of lint. So when you're managing a wound, you want to wash your hands and wear exam gloves. Washing the hands protects the patient. Wearing exam gloves protects you. You hold the dressing by one corner and you place it over the wound. You're trying not to slide it across the wound because the wound's open. The skin around is contaminated with bacteria. Even if you apply alcohol or betadine around it, within a few minutes the bacteria have moved right back in. And so by laying the dressing over the wound as opposed to dragging it across that surrounding skin, you're decreasing contamination. Also, every time your exam gloves touch the skin or anything, frankly, you're getting bacteria onto them. So avoid touching the part of the dressing that you're going to put over the wound. And then you cover it with a bandage. So what are bandages? Bandages are the things we use to hold dressings in place. And we want them to be clean. You don't want them to be contaminated. But because they're not directly contacting the wound, you don't worry so much about them being sterile. They do a number of things. They hold the dressing in place. So you got a dressing there. It's protecting the wound. You don't want it slipping around. You put a bandage over it to hold it in place. It can also be used to help apply direct pressure. And in fact, there are combat field dressings that have the bandages built in with the dressings with the idea that when you apply them, as you tighten them, they apply direct pressure. Unfortunately, most bandages provide circumferential pressure because you're tying them around things as opposed to directly applying the pressure in onto that vessel that's bleeding. And so you have to be aware of those limitations. They may reduce swelling. Well, swelling isn't a bad thing. It's part of the healing process, but they can compress an area and reduce some swelling. And they can provide some support as well for underlying structures that are injured. Now, it's easy because these are circumferential, at least on extremities, to over-tighten a bandage. You want to make sure you don't basically create a tourniquet. So if you cut off blood supply below the bandage, what's called distal to the bandage or away from the heart, you basically make the extremity have no blood supply or what's called ischemic. So you may see a blue tinge uh, to the skin or the fingernails. You lose pulses. The patient may complain initially of some tingling and numbness and then significant pain, particularly at the level of the bandage and they may not be able to move their fingers over time, and the skin will feel cold to you. So if any of that's going on, loosen the bandage. That's your, your first thing. There are a whole lot of different types of bandages. Roller bandages are the most commonly used ones, and they come in all sorts of widths and lengths and materials. You can always cut them if they're longer. If you, they're too short, you run into trouble of not having enough, but that's typically not a problem. Don't feel obligated if you have a 20-foot roller bandage to wrap 20 feet around the dressing on the wrist or the forearm. Um, you run into the same issue you, I talked about with the trauma dressings. These are absorbent too, and you can hide a lot of bleeding if you haven't controlled it. If you triple the, the circumference of the arm by putting a lot of uh, roller bandage on so self-adhering and conforming bandages tend to be elastic and more gauze-like. They stretch a bit and they conform to the extremity and to the, uh, to the dressing itself. You can also get non-elastic cotton gauze rollers and then these nice elastic roller bandages. And 
known generally as ace wrap type bandages that's the name brand but that's how people refer to them and then there's also other types of elastic roller bandages that cling to themselves vet wrap is a common brand of those but those are nice as well because they they tend to be self-adherent and don't come off you can also use triangular bandages which are really nice to have around because they do all sorts of other things too. You can use them as a bandage. You can also use them as a sling. You can use them to secure a patient to a litter or to a backboard. You can secure a splint in place. So these are great ones to have around. But the technique for putting them on is a little more complex than the roller gauze type or the, the elastic bandages. And then adhesive tape and adhesive strips can also be used to hold dressings in place. So if someone has an injury to their head and you need to put a cravat bandage on the head, you find the middle of the bandage, you apply it over the dressing, you wrap it around the head, cross the two ends snugly, and then bring them back around and tie a knot, and the knot more or less ends up where the, uh, where the dressing is. So <clears throat> that helps to secure it. These do tend to slide, and so... Just be aware that when they migrate, and they typically migrate towards the top of the head because that's narrower than where we put them, uh, that they tend to pull the dressings off as well. So that just needs to be monitored. You can put them on the arm or the leg. Again, you wrap the center of the bandage over the dressing. You go up the extremity with one, uh, one end and down with the other, and then you pull them to meet in the middle and you're tying the bandage over the dressing. So again, your knot helps to provide some compression over the, uh, over the dressing. If you've got an injury to the palm of the hand, you can put bulky dressings into the hand and then wrap one end, basically find the middle again of your cravat bandage, wrap one end around the fingers and the other around the wrist, and then encompass the whole hand and tie them at the wrist. One of the really important things to do is make sure that you don't create a mitten over the hand. You need to be able to get in there and assess blood flow to the hand. So you need access to tissue to make sure that it's not turning blue and that the patient still has sensation. And also you want to be able to assess whether the bleeding is controlled. Roller bandages, uh, the spiral method is the one that's pretty most, probably the most commonly used, just making a spiral around the, uh, the injury. And interestingly enough, I'll just point this out. You look at the picture, you realize that the, they're unrolling the roller gauze with the wrap coming out on the outside so the roll is towards the inside it's harder to apply tension that way and if you're doing this as part of a class and we do a skill session you'll see it's much easier if you keep the roll on the outside as you're applying the dressing because it unrolls more easily and you can keep better tension but anyway the spiral method you put two straight anchoring turns over your dressing and then make some overlapping crisscross and then finish with some straight turns and secure them. So you're going back and forth and that minimizes the risk of sliding, which is what often happens with these dressings. Uh, you can use what's called a figure eight method. So you generally use this around a joint. You make two straight turns of over the joint, uh, then one turn above overlap the first turn and then below overlap that first turn and you go back and forth and back and forth and that creates a, a figure of eight and then once it's in place and you have everything where you want it to go you do two more straight turns and you secure the end we'll talk about ways of securing the ends for the hand two straight turns around the palm and then diagonally back and forth you can see in the pictures it shows you the diagonal movement that holds your dressing in place. And again, all of these techniques, the idea is you're creating enough friction 
between the interacting layers of the bandages that they're not going to slide because although they may conform unless they're really elastic and even if they are elastic with the exception of the the vet wrap style of dread of uh, bandages all of them will loosen up with muscular contraction and joint movement over time. So make several more figure eight turns, you're overlapping and, and then two straight turns at the wrist and secure the end. The ankle, two straight turns around the instep, figure eight over the front, around the ankle and under the arch, and then continue the figure eights, finish with two straight turns and secure the end. So how do we secure them? Well, you can use tape. <clears throat> you can use safety pins. Safety pins are nice uh, if they, uh, they don't open up and you just have to be careful when you put them on that you don't poke the patient. And then many of the bandages will come with clips and you can see them down in the picture on the lower right. The clips are fine, but they tend to pop loose. And so my preference is when I'm initially securing one of these is to put the clips on and then put a piece of tape over the each of the clips to secure them in place. You can also do what's called a loop method and so you are wrapping around the extremity and you come to a point where you're done and this person is is doing it backwards unfortunately in the the picture, although you could get, you could do it this way, I suppose. Uh, you want to basically reverse the direction of your tapes uh, or of your your bandage, so it goes. If it's going, you're looking at the arm and you're wrapping clockwise. You then flip the bandage over your finger in the opposite direction so you're unwrapping it now counterclockwise and you go back around the extremity and so now what you end up with is that loop is one side of what you're going to tie the knot with and the end of the roller that you've now brought back in the counterclockwise direction around the extremity is the other end and you just tie them together. In the method you're seeing here that loop is going to be sort of in the middle and you're going to be tying backwards so it's not going to secure quite as well as you would want. So I, I prefer the other method where you double back externally on itself and then tie from opposite ends. You can also split the tail, cut the bandage lengthwise. Uh, you want to make sure that you have long enough tails to be able to wrap completely around the extremity or whatever you're bandaging and then tie them and you want to tie a knot right at the end of the split so it doesn't split any further and then take the tails pass them in opposite directions and tie them together. Putting on adhesive strips will always be a challenge because they will never lay down quite the way you want them to and you actually need three arms to be able to do this successfully so preferably you'll have the patient give you a hand you take off the wrapping you grab the protective strips and you peel them back put the the basically dressing the center of your adhesive strip directly on the wound and at that point have your patient put their finger on the back side of the adhesive strip so it doesn't move and you don't pull the dressing off the wound and then you just pull away the protective strips and pull the edges down and press them into place. So that is dressing and bandaging wounds. In all those cases, when you're doing the dressing of the wound, if it's a smaller wound, go ahead and apply a little bit of an antibiotic ointment uh, that will help the patient decrease the risk of getting a wound infection. And again, before you dress, make sure you've cleaned the wound well. Uh, if you don't remember this stuff, go back and review the wounds lecture, and that'll give you more information. And if you're taking this as part of a formal class, I'll see you in the classroom.